fashion reflects society. It's a mirror for things. One of the reasons why fashion is so interesting is that it constantly questions its own identity. By definition, fashion needs to be able to erase part of its history. Hugo Boss was responsible for producing the uniforms for the Nazi party. Those uniforms really emitted an aura, a dangerously beautiful one. And I think aura is what fashion traffics on. It is all about imbuing that piece of clothing with power. The Nazis used the most modern propaganda techniques available to them, from film to fashion. They were selling a product. As a cultural historian, I want to know what people wear and why they wear it. Because what we wear is a poster of who we are. That's what makes it so powerful. Don't save your kisses, pass them around. You'll find my reasoning is logically sound. Who's gonna know that you passed them around a hundred years from today? A hundred years from today. When we think of Hugo Boss, do not think of the company today. During the Nazi time, Hugo Ferdinand Boss was a producer of Nazi uniforms. And in 1945, Hugo was arrested. The Americans put these people on trial. In his case, and in most of those cases, they were usually denazified, as it was called. to ensure the occupiers that, uh, whether they were businessmen or, you know, ordinary citizens, that their complicity in the Nazi regime had been fully atoned for. He had to pay a fee, 100,000 Reichsmark. And so really didn't have to pay much for dressing the Nazis. Hugo Boss died shortly after the war in 1947. Many people project their image of the company nowadays back into the 1930s and 1940s. Hugo Boss was back then a completely different company. His daughter married a man, Eugen Holy. Eugen Holy and his two sons, they created a major success story, the Hugo Boss company we know today. And they discovered how cool the name Hugo Boss sounds, that it works perfectly as a brand. Hugo Boss separates the men from the boys. You can look at a Hugo Boss suit and because you buy one, you're more or less buying into the idea of the Hugo Boss man. There's an image that I still have from the 80s and 90s, kind of a corporate man. He wants to feel like this is the uniform that a boss man should wear. He's wearing a cream-colored wool dinner jacket, wool trousers, a cotton shirt, and a silk Glen plaid cummerbund all from Hugo Boss. That was a fashion high point for Hugo Boss. I have a really uh, personal connection to Hugo Boss since this was my late dad's perfume of choice, Boss. I wonder sometimes, like, why did he choose that particular perfume? I think it had that connection with strong masculinity. They've done such a great job of really marketing 
what boss symbolizes. Masculinity, sort of vague sense of German corporate dressing. It's just sort of this magnetizing word, boss. That's what marketing is all about. Signs and symbols, really. It's all about creating a certain myth. And this is what luxury companies do, create a myth. Almost like religion, the whole point of branding is to be very clearly defined. Like, what are your values? What do you represent? How does your history inform what's happening now? Heritage is history. Not only it's design history, but it's social history. Fashion is an unusual case where the founder, their name may be on the door. Chanel, Balenciaga, Courage, Yves Saint Laurent. The original person may have passed away. It's the responsibility for those who follow the initial founder to recreate its own history. Brands that have a history of making a certain thing, they have know-how. And there's a story which adds value and adds meaning to the product. If you don't have heritage, it's hard to establish credibility. It's hard to establish a sense of authenticity. And most of all, it's really hard to establish a sense of trust. Any of these brands that have an iconic namesake, they like to talk about who founded them. They like to talk about who started their, started their heritage, who started the story. They like to take pictures of their lifestyle and blast them all through the media. They will launch a heritage campaign where it's just to remind the consumer, hey, we've been around. Hugo Boss does not do that. Any of you uh, know a little bit about history and fashion will know that Hugo Boss made the uniforms for the Nazis. Like, and the Nazis did have flaws, but, you know, they did look fucking fantastic. Let's face it. <laughs> While they were killing people on the basis of their religion and sexuality. Many companies became involved with the Nazis. And Hugo Boss, for a long time, remained silent about this history during the Nazi years. And in the late 1990s, when it became known that the company produced SS uniforms, and they employed around 150 forced laborers, Hugo Boss couldn't remain silent. Hugo Boss technically sells clothes, but it's not the most important thing they sell. I think Hugo Boss sells the brand Hugo Boss. Everything which could damage the brand, I think this causes absolute panic in this company. And this is why uh, they hired me as a historian. The interesting thing about Hugo Boss is that he has this uh, cool name, but he was a little bit obese, he had a moustache, and was always wearing this uh, hunting outfit. He was born in a small town in southern Germany, Metzingen. He did not have a very successful career. He started an apprenticeship and didn't finish it, and then decided to found his own Taylor Company in 1924. Hugo Boss uh, wasn't officially no tailor at all. He hadn't anything to do with fashion. No distinctive designs whatsoever. He did not make the fashion magazines in the 1920s. In my own research, I started looking at women's magazines that were produced in Nazi Germany because I was really interested to know if Nazism showed up in those magazines. And as I'm looking through those magazines, I am dumbfounded by the most beautiful clothing. So I assume that most of the fashion that I'm seeing in the magazines are French, and it turns out they're not. They're Berlin. Germany was very modern. In the 1920s, Berlin made as much money on fashion as Paris did. But then Germany was hit really hard by the Great Depression, and in 1931, uh, Hugo Boss Company went bankrupt. And there is a turn in the history of the company, because in 1931, Hugo Boss uh, became a member of the Nazi party, and this finally saved his company. 
he, along with some other clothing manufacturers, started getting jobs tossed at them. So as more people joined that movement, more uniforms were needed. And so companies like Hugo Boss got those jobs. Tailoring for the party became his main business. From 1937 on, his only business were uniforms. They produced all kinds of Nazi uniforms. It's not like when Nazism started, everything stopped. There were very high fashion salons that made to order. Many of the designers were Jewish, in fact. And a lot of the Nazi officials' wives ended up going there. If you look at the pictures in the social columns, for example, you'll see this new regime show up in like, you know, Magda Goebbels and her husband are at that function or ball. As Magda Goebbels said, when the Jews disappear from Berlin, what am I gonna wear? The Jewish design salons were Aryanized, so they were taken over by enthusiastic Nazis who didn't know what they were doing. It takes until two weeks before the war starts for them to declare that the fashion world is finally free of its Jews. You have a totally destroyed fashion industry. It's just destroyed. But the fact that they were destroyed by the late 1930s, most people don't know that they even existed. The Nazis created a huge demand for uniforms. You have many organizations, and all these organizations have uh, their own uniforms. To create a uniform, you don't need a state organization to do that. You can buy it from companies like Hugo Boss, and Hugo Boss was not the only one. When you have a totalitarian state, it opens up new possibilities. You can make big deals, contracts which are huge. A lot of companies collaborate with the regime. There are a number of Hugo Bosses, I guess you could say. Because Hitler promised not just that he would make Germany great again, but that he would bring jobs back to Germany, that he would revive the industries in Germany. Many of those businessmen, I think, saw opportunity in the Nazi party. You have Hugo Bosses that will join the Nazi party in part because they think it will bring them economic benefit. I think he was an economic opportunist who saw opportunity in what the Nazis might bring his business. That said, he's an early joiner. And those are the ones that I can't help but assume embrace some of the Nazi platform. The story is quite clear, I think. It was a success story, but the success based on his cooperation with the Nazi party. The Nazis used the most modern propaganda techniques available to them. From film to fashion, they were selling a product. You can't speak about the Nazis without the dark and beautiful propaganda of, of Lenny Riefenstahl. Lenny Riefenstahl successfully made Nazism an aesthetic, a dangerously beautiful one, filled with marches and bodies wearing uniforms that were constructed as protection for war. They strived really to have 
a uniformity of the society, according to their goals and according to their ideas. You have these, these sort of three different faces of Nazism, this sort of going back to the past, men in lederhosen, and women with wide hips and dirndl dresses. And then you have this other face of uniformity and conformity. And then you have this other face that's highly stylized, highly stylized. And that's what they sell on the international stage. Nazi ideology was concerned with the idea that they can produce a new man. They start playing with the visual culture in order to implement the ideas that there are superior and inferior bodies. And the inferior bodies had to be eliminated with a totalitarian structure of government. We are able to take all parts of populations and put them in organization in order to control their behavior. If you look at the school material in Nazi Germany, children were learning the ideology of Aryan body as science. And were learning that you can separate the bad bodies from the, the good bodies. In Mein Kampf, Hitler mentioned that boys should wear shorts because Jews will have different legs. And you could identify that if everybody is wearing shorts. How far can propaganda go? And when you start talking about things like racial superiority, there's different paradigms being constructed about the world. And I do think that with Nazi Germany, it was more like a religion than it was a political party. Anytime you present an ideal, you are saying that you are wrong, this is right. You will never be able to have the perfect body of the Aryan. But that's not a point of a propaganda. Seeing something that is supposed to be desirable makes you feel like you want to be like this desirable body. It is all about imbuing that piece of clothing with power. So if the waist is cut higher, it makes the legs look longer. And long legs, in some way, sort of also conveyed this Superman, this Ubermensch. Out Caesar, out Nolus, emperor of the world. Charlie Chaplin, he was playing the dictator. Mm, and he is imitating Hitler in this case. This wearing a uniform fit is very close to that of Hitler, but some items have changed. The waist is worn higher in order to make this uniform ridiculous and to fit to this idea of the dictator who is so fond of himself. Hugo Boss definitely did not design these uniforms. He was just a commission tailor and he produced uniforms for the Nazi party and for the army. But he was not a designer. I, he did not even have the capability to design those uniforms. They advertise in the SS newspaper promoting their uniforms. 
and there was a lot of advertising for Hugo Boss uniforms. Especially for the SS, the design of the uniforms was very important because outer appearance was very important for them. Even when you have a totalitarian state where clothing is used to signal that everyone is the same. That's not how we humans work, is it? It's like we always want to make differences. We always want to mark status. We always want to know where we stand in relation to, you know, our neighbor. Brown was the color of the party, but not the color of the SS. The SS always wear black. They were responsible for the protection of Hitler. And the SS were very invested in promoting the idea that they were the aristocracy of Nazi Germany. Himmler, as uh, the leader of the SS, he was not too smart, but he had a very good instinct for public appearance and uh, how to spread different feelings. The design of the uniforms was important for Hitler and Himmler. And they decided about this uh, in personal conversations. And so the design of uniforms is all part of this SS corporate identity. It had its marks, it had its logos, and the image that was communicated to not only the world, but to the people who they wanted to bring into the party. The original swastika was not was not a symbol of Nazism. And I turned the original symbol, which has Sanskrit roots, into something that represented a completely opposite and darker impulse. It represented something as powerful as the original symbol, but it's a symbol of hate. Himmler had multiple inspirations for his ideology. So one of them was the Husaren. They were elite troops, and they wear black uniforms with the symbol of a skull. But also with um, a kind of elegance. The second source of inspiration for Himmler was the Jesuits. Aristocracy was also associated to the Jesuits. They conceived themselves as being aristocrats among all the Catholics. There are a lot of associations with black uniforms. One of them is death. It's very common to wear black in Western societies when you are going to a funeral. The second association with black uniforms is associated with secret societies. That's not something that you can say, well, secret societies wear black. But there is a kind of fantasy around it. Transcendence, that, and secret society were ideas that were influenced Himmler. Himmler start really constructing new traditions and constructing new narratives. All these ideas are part of um, a high fashion uniform with this function to build up the narrative connected to the SS. The Nazis have this very modern face that's very stylish, very fashionable. Part of that had to do with the fact that the, the top-level Nazis uh, were not stylish or fashionable. They wanted to be accepted. They wanted to be fashionable. So you have propaganda minister Goebbels who spends a fortune on his clothes. The Nazis understand that looking stylish to the outside world sends a message. It doesn't surprise me that it would last, that the allure and the mystique of it would enthrall people for generations after.
Well, most people will say, oh, I don't really think about what I wear. I just wear what's comfortable or what's cheap. Um, they absolutely make choices whether they're aware of it or not. This analogy of black SS uniforms and black business suits contributes to this uh, perfectly working Hugo Boss Nazi story. From an aesthetic point of view, there is obviously something into it. When you wear black business suits, you want to show something. It's like a shining armor of modern capitalism. I mean, suits still signify a kind of stern uh, professionalism or a kind of remove. A fascination for uniforms comes from the desire to reduce complexity and to make things kind of strong and simple. With uniforms, you lose your identity. You become a member of a collectivity. Uniformity has become a state of mind. They connect you to a particular group. If you're wearing uniform, this is your identity. Something really sharp and orderly, which feels tailored and like fashion, but carries with it a sense of aggression or violence or darkness, feels aesthetically compelling. I think even a moment in history as fraught as Nazi Germany and the Second World War, that aesthetic, somehow, it's like it appeals to that sense of danger. Obviously, the a fashion designer today could never say, I'm inspired by Nazi uniforms, God forbid, you know? But you can say, I'm inspired by, you know, something cool in underground that in turn was inspired by a Nazi uniform. A fashion designer, for example, could totally get away with saying my collection this season has been inspired by The Night Porter because that's a cult 1970s film with an iconic actress. That's okay. But those uniforms are based on Nazi uniforms. Those kind of, you know, on the edge type references, they're always coming back to us again. One of the reasons why fashion is so interesting is that it constantly questions its own identity. It is camouflaged as a subject that is quite unintelligent. But I do think that clothes and its glamorous twin fashion really can speak volumes about people's inherited histories, inherited societal values, um, its taboos. I mean, this is the whole reason why we're speaking about Hugo Boss, right? Hugo Boss has a very specific historical situation that it faces. It is certainly documented, this chapter of Hugo Boss in his house, um, and it is historically true and a fact. But I think the most important thing for any house, any brand, including Hugo Boss, is to think about what its place in contemporary society is today grappling with that heritage design-wise and socially is a really tricky path. That's why it's just such a rich field to explore because it's so multi-layered and it's so subjective in terms of the meanings we pour into it. Consumer analysts say that we are in an age where consumers define their identity by their purchases. Your purchases now define you as a person. People wear clothing, logos, and slogans, and symbols all the time, willfully and purposefully. I think one of the reasons why I've always been interested in fashion is it was one way to assimilate. I think that's a pretty human impulse. In a you know political election, there's like, you know, make America great again in a red baseball hat. If it's act up, it's a pink triangle. Could be like Yeezy merch. There are so many different symbols that people intentionally wear. Maybe a 15-year-old doesn't dream about owning a couture ball gown anymore. You know, a 15-year-old is dreaming about getting a Supreme t-shirt. Something with branding on it that can allow them to broadcast that they're part of a tribe. 
the way people tote and bear certain logos and brands and their allegiances, you would swear that this was a spiritual association. The cultural symbolism of Hugo Boss is kind of unclear. That's an opportunity for the brand to redefine itself. Fashion has an ability to actually define the new and the next, meaning the future. It's definitely important to think about the clothing that you decide to put on your body. Think about what you're wearing in a really intentional way and not just passively sign up for it. <laughs>